the United States is taking steps to impose visa restrictions on specific individuals in Nigeria for undermining the democratic process during the just concluded 2003 general elections. In a statement by the U.S. Secretary of State, Mr. Antony Blinken, he said that, quote, the United States is committed to supporting and advancing democracy in Nigeria and around the world. Today, I'm announcing that we have taken steps to impose visa restrictions on specific individuals in Nigeria for undermining the democratic process during the Nigeria's 2023 election cycle. End of quote. Well, those are words filled with a lot of uh, uh, a lot of issues and a lot of implications, of course. Um, America's intervention on our elections. Who are these people? Um, it, it wasn't clearly stated in that statement released uh, by the U.S. Secretary of State. But then, uh, let's get some perspectives into this matter. Um, I mean, the decision of the United States, what it means on our electoral process. This is not the first time we've seen this happen. I'm being joined tonight on the program on this matter. Uh, Hamza Lawal, who is one of those... Uh, uh, the leaders of one of the organizations who deployed um, hundreds of people on the field to observe the election uh, during the election. Amza Lawal is a chief executive of Connected Development. He joins me live from London virtually. Thank you so much, Hamza, for joining us tonight. Does this come to you as a surprise, the decision of the United States to take, uh, I mean, it does look like a promise being made and promise kept that, that they will place uh, a restriction of visa visa restriction on Nigerians who undermine the electoral process. And now they have announced that they have done that. Does this come to you as a surprise? And no, it doesn't. And thank you for having me, Sharon. Uh, the U.S. government before the election had said that they are monitoring our elections closely and they would not relent in putting a ban and holding people to account who try to interfere in Nigeria's democracy. And today, the Secretary of State have made this announcement. The next, for me, is uh, what should have come with this announcement is the names of these people who they've placed under the visa ban. Because, uh, you know, uh, we cannot run the country without consequence. Before, during, and after the elections, we saw people peddling fake news. We saw people interfering with the independent work of INEC. We saw people colluding with security agencies. We saw politicians empowering Togs and miscreant to um, and hoodlums, you know, to disrupt the elections. I'm really glad that the American government have taken this bold first step in placing a visa ban. I, I want to urge the United Kingdom government and you know our partners under the European Union to also follow suit. These people cannot cause mayhem and instability in Nigeria and go and find safe havens uh, in in America or other parts of the world when they cannot guarantee and ensure peace and prosperity. So this is really commendable. And America has shown that truly she's a friend to Nigeria and she's willing and committed to supporting Nigeria's democracy as we evolve. So there, will, there are likely uh, a possibility of speculations on who these personalities are and uh, what, uh, to what extent their roles and how far is the United States investigation? What evidence do they have uh, to impose this kind of ban? And you had suggested that they should name names. Uh, what consequence would it be if they had named names? They don't have a history of naming names for those who they play visa ban on. I think that it, it also goes further to be more transparent in this process, but also send a signal that uh, you know, there are consequences to action. If they had named this name, then Nigerian people can actually also know that even if her government and some institution are not acting, the international community are watching and they have acted, particularly the American government. I think it would have gone a long way. Yes, I can understand that judicial process is ongoing and maybe they're not uh, publishing this name so they don't interfere with that process. But I think that they owe it to the Nigerian people who are their friends and partners. Uh, you know, because what we have even taught is some of these people who interfered in our election process should have been prosecuted or even brought behind bars by the Nigerian police, which is the apex law enforcement agency. 
I want to also believe that these people who have been placed on the uh, visa ban by the American government should not only be politicians. We saw uh, private citizens. We saw former lawmakers. We saw even law enforcement agencies that are saddled with the responsibility to ensure peace and stability in the country who colluded with corrupt politicians and mischief makers. But again, this is a right step. And this is one step that would lead to other steps by the American government, I believe. But I think in due time, they should publish these names and we should know. So that as civil society, what we would now do is inaugurate them in the hall of shame. So, I mean, there are a lot of consequences, I assume. But what, because I would like to come to um, what America could also do if they have evidence that these people really undermine the electoral process and they justify, uh, justifiably so, uh, and they, they have reasons to uh, punish them for this, for not allowing them to enter their country. But uh, what would a visa restriction be on some of these persons? Um, they don't enter into America. So what? I mean, what are the implications? And I mean, what can we learn? from the decision of America? Well, we know that some of these countries in the past have played a role of safe heavens for these politicians. We know these politicians like to go to America to access health care. We know that their families and cronies are there. Some of them, their kids also school in America and their family members leave and have investment in America. We also know some of these politicians actually uh, invest heavily in that economy. So I think this you know, goes a long way in denying them access to quality lifestyle, denying them access to health care. Uh, maybe in the future, they might also want to add people that are connected to these politicians. Then there'll be pressure from their family members to ensure that they do the right and not interfere with their democracy. But it actually goes a long way. When you want to access freedom of movement or even access to the world power, and then you're denied that access. And that's why I'm also calling on the United Kingdom government and also the European Union government. Let us deny them that safe heaven so that they can ensure that, you know, we have peace and prosperity and no one trample upon our democracy that is emerging so that we can enjoy peace and prosperity. And then we can ensure that the Nigerian people enjoy the dividends of democracy. So everyone should stay in their home and let them invest in their homes and in the country so that the Nigerian people can benefit you know, and then we can have quality lifestyle, quality healthcare, education, and, and don't give them that leverage or that privilege to enjoy, um, you know, good healthcare and, and other social amenities beyond the country that they've caused instability. So, I mean, let's look at it in a broader sense. Anybody who undermine our democracy should be brought to book, isn't it, Amzad? And they should be punished duly under our laws. And I'm assuming that if America has any information or evidence against some of these persons, shouldn't they be working with the Nigerian authority to really bring these persons to book other than these visa restrictions? Well, I, I know that the American government and the Nigerian government have diplomatic channels in which they communicate. I want to believe that the Minister of Foreign Affairs would have reached out to the Nigerian mission uh, in in New York or in DC uh, to get the the uh, Department of State to provide these names of the people and open that diplomatic channels to get information about the role of these people, the evidence that the American government have gathered and how they can work with the Nigerian authority, particularly the law enforcement agencies, and then prosecute them under the Nigerian laws. I want to believe that these channels are open and the Nigerian government must leverage on this channel if they want to show commitment towards Nigeria's prosperity, stability, and democratic deepening. Uh, so what lesson do you think we can take away from, from this uh, posture of the United States? I think the lessons we can take away from it is what are our values? Because today the American people and government are showing us that their values and their consequence to actions and inactions and how this also uh, impacts our democracy. I think the lessons here is as Nigerian people, as Nigerian state, what is our values? Are we running a country without consequence? Are we saying that everything go? Are we saying that we're not governed by the rule of law? Are we saying that people, individuals are more stronger than institutions. So the lesson here is, as a people, we need to reflect and think 
and not allow external parties or our friends in the international community to take action before us. We must seize the moment, seize the opportunity, own our democracy and take those actions. And those actions must come with consequences and our government must rise to the occasion. I think these are some of the lessons. And as citizens, we must continue to strive in the face of as vice we must continue to strive. We must hold strong to our values and ensure that Nigeria, uh, all of in, each and every one of us play our role in nation building. There has been this back and forth between the police, INEC, um, uh, at some point where INEC would say, um, we don't have the power to prosecute. And the police will say, it is incumbent on INEC to take action when there is an election offender and it comes to one thing that the Electoral Offenses Commission has been proposed uh, severally. And those, I mean, people who have uh, brought up this idea to say we need an Electoral Offenses Commission to be able to prosecute electoral offenses in Nigeria. Um, that is not seen the light of day. Uh, the present National Assembly has been working on that. And I've had a series of conversations on this program. Uh, to that effect, asking those who are in charge, the lawmakers, on the, the need uh, and the, how the, the status of that bill, which I'm not sure, uh, <laughs> for example, Harry has just a few days left in office, and I'm not sure that bill is on his table just yet. That means we are on a longer ride in prosecuting those who are responsible in undermining our uh, election. And for those who are arguing that, look, Already, uh, there are sufficient po uh, positions of the law in our electoral law uh, to punish uh, electoral offenders. What's your take for someone also who has monitored this process? And what, what are your views on the atmosphere uh, within uh, to punish those who, uh, who, who rig elections in Nigeria or undermine our democracy? I think the 2023 general election have provided us an opportunity to test the 2022 electoral act signed by Mr. President. And as stakeholders, we've identified uh, holes and gaps that we would work closely with the 10 National Assembly to uh, uh, close. But you know, Shin, I'm also against the Electoral Offenses Commission. You see, we're currently running a recurrent expenditure where even some MDAs or government agencies cannot pay salary. We have so many. MDAs and a lot of them are duplicating efforts of each other's. So I think that the Nigerian police, which is the APEC law enforcement agency, if they're empowered, give it the needed resources and the manpower, I believe that they can rise to the occasion. But I also think that it's highly truly independent. And you know, let's not provide lip service and because they have independence in their name. I think we need an independent INEC that politicians and elected officials, even the president cannot interfere with the mandate of INEC, where they have their first line charge resources and they're able to access these resources in good time. And I think when we amend the Electoral Act of 2022, maybe we can empower INEC to go a step further, working closely with the Nigerian police so that people who are caught wanting on electoral offenses can be prosecuted in no time. And maybe when we put the time limit so that when INEC gather evidence and work with the Nigerian police, we can get justice in due time and put these people behind bars. Because if we achieve this, then we'll see decline in electoral related offenses. We'll see decline in violence during election and even interference by mischief makers and corrupt politicians. I mean, not only that people stuff ballot boxes, uh, snatch ballot boxes, the uh, right result and rewrite result, change the result, delay the process of election. There were some uh, tactical ways of undermining the electoral process, some, some new ways we saw emerge in our electoral process in the last election, which are, for a long time, it will challenge the relationships between Nigerians. A lot of people have been hard, badly divided along religious and ethnic lines. Politics has really dented people's uh, relationships. And I've seen in, in a very terrible way how Nigerians could react and act towards themselves just in the name of politics. It's brought out the worst of us this election. Um, I mean, these are other dimensions which maybe the Americans uh, that are looking at imposing visa restriction may not envisage. 
These are new methods. These are new ways by which people have suffered the other, uh, others and trampled upon the rights of others. What are your perspectives on some of these that have emerged, perhaps that we did not imagine, that will crop up during our elections? You know, Sean, um, as humans, we will continue to evolve and people continue to find holes and gaps and leverage on religion and ethnicity to try to divide us. But I think that from some of the lessons as a country, we need to move forward and we need to move forward quickly. I think we should take a leap or a leave rather from Plateau State, where they have a national forgiveness day and where they talk about issues that have divided them and forgive people and take lessons from that. You see, Sheung, I also traveled a few weeks ago to Rwanda, Kigali. This is a country that they have the same culture, they speak the same language and look like the same. But, you know, within 100 days, uh, over a thousand people were killed, you know, because of ethnicity and, and that difference amongst themselves. But when you look at this deeply, it's also about economic empowerment. You see, when people have jobs and they're busy, they would not uh, find themselves as tools to be used against the state or against you know opposition. So I think really we need to reflect, find a way to move forward and forgive ourselves. But I think closely we need to now see the importance of religious and traditional institutions. How we can also sensitize people and make them understand that you know election itself, it's a process. The debate, it's a process. The campaign is a process. It is not the end result. You know, as citizens, and each and every one of us have a role to play. You know, we've come forward past this 2023 election. For me, I want to believe that the president-elect, once one into office, can rally around people and firstly the campaign around reconciliation and peace, you know, because I think that he, even if he doesn't have popular votes, but he has the highest votes and has the mandate of the popular, of the popularity vote. So I, I think he needs to lead that campaign of national unity and reconciliation. Uh, I want to believe that he would even reach out to his opposition and see how he can have a government of national unity and work with people who don't even believe in the same ideologies as he is. You see, Nigeria cannot afford to remain stagnant. We need to move forward. The world has left us behind, and we need to catch up and even, you know, move past some of this world countries that we were even doing better than. So for me, I don't want to dwell on religion and ethnicity. I want to see, I want to believe that Nigerians have learned our lessons, and we need to grow from those lessons and deepen our democracy. Our democracy is very young and we're still evolving. We must learn lessons from countries like Rwanda. We must take lessons from other countries who have made the same mistake, but not repeat this mistake, but rather let's, you know, let peace reign, let's shelve our swords and let's reconcile. Besides, you know, first is our country and this country has binded us and let's look and, you know, let's look out for the things that unite us more than the things that have divided us. But our leaders must come together, civil society, as media, as traditional religious institution, and political uh, society. Let us work together and truly make this country great. Perhaps in a, man, uh, in a way to wrap up on this issue, Amza, um, what would be the biggest lesson for us as a people when we have a nation like the United States uh, make this kind of intervention into our democratic process? I think the biggest lesson here is how the world perceives us and how we as Nigerians can start changing the narrative. Yes, a couple of young people out there are doing very well. You see, the first thing people know about you is your country. You know, we all have one passport. So yes, young people are striving to change this narrative, but it also goes a long way and, you know, politics sets the tone. So I believe our biggest lessons as actors, but as civil society, media society, political society, and the public, is to first put Nigeria first before anything else. Because if we do that, then that shows patriotism, and that also shows that we're playing our role in nation building. Uh, this would also impact how we fight uh, insecurity in the country, because we know that we procure some of our weapons uh, from uh, this world leader. So again, uh, the perception around how they take us or how they even we uh, you know how they see us and most importantly how they're able to now respect us and say you know we're a country who is committed to democrat democracy have values and ensuring that truly the nigerian people have the powers to decide who governs and lead them into prosperity 
I mean, <laughs> something just comes to my head to, right now, and uh, I'm imagining that uh, this visa ban, assuming that um, there is anyone who is elected into office that um, uh, that is uh, fingered in these infractions or uh, that is being fingered by the United States in these uh, uh, undermining of our democracy as the United States tagged it. <laughs> What does this mean, anyway? Is that I mean, if America is to have a relationship with such persons on behalf of Nigeria? I think that's why it's important the, that the American government publish this name, so that uh, we would not put ourselves in more jeopardy in putting people in committees or even appointing people that already have a bad record with uh, how they interfered in our democracy. Uh, and, and being put on this ban by the American government. Yes, we know that if some persons uh, get government appointment into office, they're most likely to get an official passport, or in some cases, also a diplomatic passport. But the, uh, the American government as a sovereign nation also have the powers to deny them entry into their country or into their territory. Uh, same way the Nigerian government as a sovereign nation also have powers and right to deny people into their own sovereign our territories. Let me take you to what is happening here in Abuja with the governor's induction. You have initiated and uh, um, follow through with uh, follow the money, an initiative to track funds and expenditures of public uh, office holders and public offices in Nigeria. What do you make of this induction process? Uh, I mean, more or less like a talk shop. Uh, for some people who have criticized it, but in your own view, how would you describe and how would you assess these and what are your expectations? Well, Sheung, there must always be an induction. It's just like an onboarding when you're hired, you know, as a new employee. The National Assembly has been uh, undertaking an onboarding or an induction and, you know, the, uh, you know, the governors will not be left out. Even when the president-elect is sworn into office, his ministers will also be inducted. But I also think that it's important as a country that we take stock on the past eight years and the roles of these outgoing governors. And also take stock as civil society of the promises made by the incoming governors, because that would also set the basis to uh, engage them. But most importantly, when they start budgeting and proposing this budget appropriation to the state assembly, how we're engaging this arm of government and ensuring that their promises are where this monies are going to go to. And most importantly, when they disperse, you know, they're going to uh, ensure this monies are used judiciously. But you know, Shewo, I'm really worried. I'm worried because you see, uh, when you look at the World Bank Development uh, uh, Report uh, that they always release every quarter, uh, one issue that was shying away from is the issue of wealth subsidy. I remember during a dialogue uh, with uh, Malam Nasir Erufai and Professor Charles Soludo, they all say that very soon they will not be able to pay salaries. There are some states that can only even afford to pay percentage salary because there are dwindling uh, resources from non-oil uh, revenue. And we also know that, yes, the oil price in the international market, crude oil price is not doing well. Who will subsidize uh, crude oil or, or PMS, you know, petroleum pump price, we're subsidizing. And if we continue to subsidize, you know, and yes, if you look at the 2023 budget, it says by the end of June or so, we're going to stop subsidizing. And if we truly want to implement the Petroleum Industry Act, you know, we must subsidize. I believe, we'll, yes, we're going to make significant uh, savings from subsidy if we remove subsidy by June ending, before the end of this year, we are likely to make over two to three trillion Naira savings. And when you look at it, let's look at even data around which state consumes, uh, you know, PMS. Uh, if you look at data, it is the border state. And what this also tells you is your border countries, what is the average price of PMS in these countries? It is only Nigeria who is in the middle that subsidized. So, that's why people will continue to steal and smuggle fuels that are cheap, that have been subsidized in Nigeria and go on, make you know, three or four times profit around our borders or countries that we bother with. So I, I think these governors need to also look beyond you know, this sharing of feeding bottle 
Federation, where they just send their commissioners for finance to come and share money. There's no money to share this time. Well, it means that every state has to be viable. They have to ensure that they are viable. They, they're not only viable by uh, raising uh, you know, domestic bonds or domestic resources, but they are also able to export goods and services that would end us forex because right now you know our, our reserves have been depleted you know we're subsidizing and we're just a consumer a consuming nation you know we need to become more innovative and produce you know there are countries who their production is uh, services you know they're good with services nigeria have mass uh, uh farmland and we have mass natural resources so we need these executive governors yes no it's not a talk shop show as governors, they also need to network. Oh. We're dealing with insecurity. So this governor share, some of these states share borders, and they need to work together effectively oh. to ensure that we're able to contain insecurity and provide the events of democracy to the Nigerian people. Amza Lawal uh, is the chief executive of Connected Development, has been speaking with us virtually from London. Thank you so much, Amza, for your time tonight. Well, thank you for having me. Have a good evening.